Well, welcome to week two of the Unseen War. And last week, if you were uh, here with us, whether you're online or you're on campus, Pastor Kevin shared about the importance of standing strong, of understanding the power of wielding spiritual weapons from Ephesians 6. We talked about the realities of the unseen war. And this week, we're going to talk about knowing the tactics of the enemy so that we can walk in victory. And as I was preparing this message over the last two months, I just want to share with you this morning, this has probably been the hardest message that I've ever prepared. This has been probably the most difficult sermon that I've had to write. And I don't believe that's by accident because I believe with all my heart that the enemy of our souls loves to operate in the shadows back in this area. And when we come and we bring the word of God to the people of God to inspire people to grow and walk to be more like Jesus and we illuminate the enemy and his schemes and his lies and his tactics, guess what the enemy does? He doesn't stand idly by. And so over the last two months, I have to tell you, my family and I have been undergoing a lot of spiritual attacks, many different aspects of that. In fact, I know for some of you, you've probably also been under spiritual attack as we've entered into this two-week sermon series focused on the reality of this unseen war. And so what I did earlier this week, I enlisted some help. I enlisted some help from some prayer warriors, some men in my life that would come alongside and pray for me and pray for you, pray for this service and pray for our church. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to go to the Lord in prayer. And so I want to invite you, along with those warriors, those prayer warriors, to join me as we pray for our time, as we open God's word. And so, Lord Jesus, we come before you, the King of kings, our high priest, interceding on our behalf in heaven. And so, Jesus, we want to pray right now that you would, through each one of us, would you speak to us through the power of your word and the work of your Holy Spirit? And Jesus, we know also that the enemy is not going to sit idly by. And so, Jesus, we pray that this is your church. We know this is your church. So, Jesus, as we pray, Jesus, would you protect our church? Would you protect our minds? Would you protect our hearts? Would you guard us from the lies and the schemes of the enemies? And so, Jesus, we pray that we give this time to you and we ask you, Jesus, to change us, to transform us, to be more like you. And we lift this up to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're talking about the enemy of our souls. We're talking about Satan. We're talking about Lucifer. We're talking about the tempter. We're talking about the accuser. All the names that he goes by. What do we know about our enemy? What do we know about our enemy? We know this. He is real relentless, and really hates God, his plans, and his people. We know that. He is real. He's not some cartoon character or some Hollywood-created fictional character on a screen. He's real. He's a real spiritual being that was created who willfully rebelled against God. He was cast out of God's presence, and he has been in direct opposition to God and his people and his plans for millennia. He is real. He's also relentless. And what we do know as we read God's word and we get to the end of God's and we, we, we're reminded by that song we just sang, we get to Revelation, we're like, oh, the enemy is cast out. The enemy's fate is sealed. He is doomed. But as his time is running out, guess what he's doing? He's ramping up. He's ramping up his attacks on God's people. And we also know that he is fueled by hatred for God and God's children. And I want to be clear. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the enemy cannot possess you. Because you've given your life to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you. You are eternally secure with God. God's word said that nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hands. And that nothing can separate you from the love of God for those who are in Christ Jesus so you are eternally secure. But what can the enemy do to you and your family, your friends? He can attack. He can attack. And for some of you today, you say, well, I'm not a follower of Jesus, so I'm safe. You're watching online, you're here on campus. Know this. He hates you too. 
He hates you. And why does he hate you? Because when he looks at you, he sees imago Dei. He sees the image of God. You were created in the image of God. Your, my loving heavenly father created you in his image. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit created you. And so when the enemy looks at you, he can't stand to see the goodness of God. And so he hates you. So he wants to blind you. And he wants to bind you and hold you back. That's the enemy of our souls. And so what's the enemy's strategy? What's his end goal? What's his purpose? Well, Jesus gives us a pretty clear picture of that. We see in John 10.10, we read these words. This is Jesus talking. Jesus says, the thief, and he's talking about the enemy here. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The enemy's sole purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And he will do that. He comes to steal your joy. He wants to steal your peace. He wants to kill your relationships, marriages, friendships, whatever it might be. He wants to destroy your life. He is the destroyer of anything good and anything of God. And so he wants to destroy you. He is also a liar. He's a liar. And we read this again. Jesus is talking in John 8, 44. Jesus said this about Satan. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Did you get that? Jesus is three times talking about the enemy, and when he speaks, literally anything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. It's a lie. So he is a liar. He is a murderer. He is a stealer, a killer, a destroyer, and he is a thief. And what we know this is that the enemy's heart is filled with pride. That was his original downfall. It's filled with pride. His mind is, is fueled, filled by hatred. And guess what? Everything that he speaks, everything that comes out of his mouth is simply a lie. It's a lie. And so as we look at the enemy, we've got to understand his strategy and understand what he's made up of. Lies and hatred. And we recognize that the enemy, then to accomplish his strategy, to accomplish his goal, he has tactics. And he has tactics that he has used over millennia with great success. His tactics which he employs with consistency and tenacity and lethality. And let those words just sink in on you. Consistency. Time and time again, he's had success. And not only that, but he also is very tenacious. We're going to find out when we read a passage from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. He is tenacious, relentless. And not only that, but his tactics are lethal, lethal tactics. And he's honed these tactics over millennia with great success. And we go, absolutely, Pastor Sean, I can 100% affirm that because I know for a fact, I have seen the effects of his tactics in my own family and my own life. We've all seen that, haven't we? We've experienced. We've watched his marriages have been destroyed by the lies of the enemy. We've, wa we've watched his relationships and friendships have been stolen because of the lies of the enemy. And even as a soldier, I, I watched I watch soldiers' lives taken away from them because of the enemy's work in other evil people. The enemy tactics are lethal. And so today as we talk and as we share, as I share this morning, I think it would be easy for me to come up here and present to you a dozen or so different tactics and if we had more time, we would. We have a podcast. So Pastor Kevin and I shared in that podcast some of the other tactics. But I want to do this morning is I want to really, with laser focus, focus in on the enemy's two battle-tested tactics. Because I believe if we can recognize and resist these two tactics, all the other tactics that he uses against us are sort of like sub-tactics that come from this. 
And so what we're going to do is I want to take you to an epic battlefield, to an epic battleground, and it's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and we're going to read from verses 1 through 11, and what we're going to see in this battle is a battle between the prince of darkness and the prince of peace, this battle in the wilderness. And so if you have your Bibles or you have your Bible apps, you can join me, and let's read beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, I want to just pause right there. Think about it. Has anybody fasted 40 days, 40 nights? Think about what Jesus was experiencing here physically. He's fully God, but yet he's fully man. And so he's in this isolated, desolate place in the wilderness somewhere in Israel. And guess what happens? When he's in that physically exhausted state, who comes? The tempter. Verse 3 says, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we have an attack from the enemy, and Jesus counterattacks. And how does he counterattack? With God's word. God's word. Let's pick it up. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now what's Satan doing there? He's quoting scripture, isn't he? He's quoting scripture to Jesus. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Another attack, another counterattack from Jesus. And what, how does Jesus counterattack? With God's word. Here we go. Pick it up. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 11, Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Like, we expect it's going to be this epic battle, the prince of darkness versus the prince of peace. And what do we find out? It really wasn't a battle after all. Jesus Christ The enemy is no match for the power of Jesus. And so as we look at this battle scene, what two tactics do we see? The first one is this, temptation. We even see the enemy's, the tempter, temptation. And temptation is simply this, enticing to sin by promise of pleasure or gain. And that simply means this, the sin is to think, to act, to speak against God and against the will of God, against the word of God, and that's sin. And so what was Satan trying to do with Jesus here? He was trying to tempt Jesus into doing what? To exercise his power and authority outside of the will and the plan of the Father. And his end goal was what? If Jesus succumbed to one of these temptations, to guess what? That he would lie and steal and kill and destroy, destroy the relationship between the Son and the Father, That was his goal here. And so we see that the enemy tempted Jesus to exercise his power in that manner. And so what did he do? The enemy used three different tactics, didn't he? Kind of came at him in three different ways. First was, you know, turn these stones into bread. You're hungry, and since you're the son of God, go ahead and just turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. It's written, right? We don't live off of bread. We live off of what? The Word of God. So he's tempting Jesus with pleasure, pleasing yourself. Also, we see that he says, throw yourself down. He's simply saying, fulfill Scripture. It's written right here in Scripture. Just fulfill that Scripture, Jesus. And as you do, think about the spectacle that that will create. People will know that you are the Messiah then. So what's he tempting Jesus there with? He's tempting Jesus with pride, his original sin, pride. And then finally, he says, worship me. That's his thing. All this, all this I will give you. 
And so now he's tempting Jesus with what? Power. Power. But as we know, Jesus recognized and he resisted. And so in doing so, Jesus gives us what? He gives us the model of how we, as his followers, are to resist the enemy's temptation in our life. Jesus also proves his faithfulness, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, that Jesus did not succumb to temptation. And I think that temptation sometimes can be somewhat confusing. And so let me just ask you, church, this. Is being tempted a sin? Is being tempted a sin? And the answer is no, because we see right here, Jesus was tempted not once, not twice, but three times. And so we know Jesus never sinned. He was sinless. We know that the Bible says that he was tempted in every way, like us, yet he was without sin. So we recognize that. And so we know that acting, though, on that temptation is sinful. Something entices us to sin and we act out on it. That is sinful. But being tempted is not sinful. And here's the other. Are all temptations from the enemy? Do we just give the enemy credit for every temptation? What's the answer, church? The answer is no. Because what we know is that our hearts, there's an innate ability within us to always try to do what? To please ourselves and to sin against God. And so what we know is now, it may not come from the enemy, it might come from our own sinful, self-centered manner. But the enemy delights when we take steps towards sin, doesn't he? He loves to feel that sin. And so we think about this question then, church, for us. If he tempted Jesus, do you think he's going to tempt you? Do you think he'll tempt me? And the answer is we all shake our heads because we're all going, oh, yeah, I know it all too well. We all are going to be tempted by the enemy. And the thing is, Satan has mastered the art of temptation. He doesn't use like a one-size-fits-all approach. He knows how to tailor his temptation to each one of us. He knows how to tailor his temptation and lure each one of us in a unique way. So what I want to do is I want to show you a video clip here of three different creatures who have perfected the art of temptation. And I want you to notice the different lures that they use to tempt their prey. All right, so here's the first one coming up here. None other than the, yes, we all know, the Venus flytrap, the scent, the look, the taste of the nectar. This is the anglerfish. Yes, that's actually part of its body. And look, it looks like a, a little piece of meat, morsel. There we go, this beautiful little shrimp, the innocent, unbeknownst to the shrimp, in the blink of an eye, he's gone. Lethal. How about this? This is the alligator snapping turtle. His tongue looks like a worm wiggling in the water. Oh, little guppy, stay away. Now, why do I show that video to you this morning? Why do we show you that? Because think about the different lures. Three different creatures, three different lures, and what might have worked on one wouldn't necessarily work on the other. But what was the end result for the three different kinds of prey? It was all destruction. And I think about the tempter, the enemy of our souls, how he tries to lure us into sinning. In the blink of an eye, we fall for it. Maybe it's the text that we decide to send. Maybe it's the screen that we decide to watch. Maybe it's the words that we get ready to speak. But in the blink of an eye, he's got us. Steal and kill and destroy your life, your marriage, your friendships. That's his goal. So a question then for each one of us this morning is how does the enemy typically tempt you? How does the enemy tempt you? How does he entice you? How does he lure you into sin? And again, for each one of us, it's going to be different. And so one of the ways we can tell is where has he had success in the past? Maybe it's lies that he speaks and we fall for those lies. Maybe it's he, he offers us pleasure that we know is only temporary and fleeting and it's not of God. Or maybe it's power or shortcuts 
to power and prestige. Maybe it's lust and maybe it's pleasure. But he knows our weaknesses. He knows our vulnerabilities. And so what we've got to be able to do is recognize and resist in the power of Jesus. Amen? And so one of the words, one of the questions that I often ask when I, because I, like your other pastors, our pastors here at Shoreline, your pastors, do you think we're tempted? Oh, yeah. Like you, we're tempted as well. And so one of the questions that I often ask when I'm tempted when something presents itself, and I believe it's from the enemy, all I have to do is ask this one question. Is it good? Is it good? Is it honoring to God? Is it honoring to myself? Is it honoring to my family to know whether or not it's from the enemy or whether or not something good that God is offering to me? I need to say, is it good? And the answer is not, well, it makes me feel good, because we know the enemy loves to get us going down that track, doesn't he? But is it good? Is it good? Is it from God? So what we know is the enemy will use temptation. His first tactic. He used it in the garden, and he used it against Jesus, and he continues to use it today. The second tactic is this, deception. And deception is simply concealing the truth and misleading someone to believe what is false. It's misleading someone to believe what is false. And the enemy does this. He attempts to conceal the truth. That's how he does it. He attempts to conceal the truth of who he is. Again, he wants to stay back in the shadows. He wants people to think that he doesn't exist even at all. The enemy also tries to conceal the truth of who God is. He conceals the truth of who God is, his nature and what God has done. I mean, he, he wants us to not believe that. For many years of my life, before I became a Christ follower, I believed a false narrative about God. And it was the enemy that had blinded me, had concealed the truth from me. And also, he conceals the truth of God's word. See, he tried with Jesus. He actually tried. Isn't it interesting that the, he tried to get Jesus to believe something false about God's word? He tried to convince Jesus. And if you remember what he did, he quoted from Psalm 91, the enemy did. And this Psalm 91, verse 11, says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And so that's how he tried to twist Scripture. He tried to use it for his own benefit. He tried to get Jesus to believe and fall for that. But you know what's interesting is? Since he's the father of lies and he can only speak lies, he never speaks the whole of God's truth. He omits things and he twists things. Do you know what he omitted from Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12? The next verse after that, verse 13 says... This is what it says. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. This psalm was written as a messianic psalm. It's a prophecy of Jesus, the Messiah that would come. And what Satan did is he read 11 and 12, but guess what he didn't read? The part about Jesus treading on the lion and the cobra, the serpent and the great lion. What are the names of the animals that we typically associate the enemy with? The serpent and the great lion. You see how Satan omitted that portion? He just conveniently left that off. He tried to twist Scripture. He tried to get Jesus to believe something that was not true. And so like he did with Jesus, he also tries to mislead us to get to believe things that are false. And how does he do it? He masquerades as good. The Bible says that the enemy is a, he masquerades as an angel of light, and so what he does is he masquerades as good. So he presents something as good when in fact it's evil. And he tries to twist the truth. So the, a couple of weeks ago, I want to share something with you. The enemy operates kind of like a hacker or a spammer, right? The hacker or spammer, they try to mislead you into believing that they're doing something good so that they can do what? They can access your computer, your phone, then to gain entry, a foothold in your life. So a couple of weeks ago, I get this text, and it, this is what the text is. We're going to put it up on the screen there. You can see it. Some of you may not be able to see it that far away. Let me read it for you. So it's 1.08 in the afternoon, I get this text from Pastor Kevin. It says, hello, Sean. Are you available? I need you to get something done. Oh, this is Kevin Harney. Now, you're all kind of chuckling because you're, wait, I don't think that's Pastor Kevin. 
Now, how do I know that that's not Pastor Kevin? Well, number one, that's not Pastor Kevin's phone number. The last I checked, his area code, he doesn't have a phone from Chicago, Illinois. You can check that, 773 Chicago. So I knew that wasn't him. Second is, that's not how Pastor Kevin communicates in a text. I've known him for the last nine years. I've worked for him very closely. He doesn't communicate that way. Are you available? I need you to get something done. That sounds kind of bossy. That's not Pastor Kevin. And then the last thing there is, how did I know it wasn't him? Because when I got that text, I was sitting in a meeting, and guess who was sitting right next to me? <laughs> Pastor Kevin. <laughs> Pastor Kevin. I'm like, that's not Pastor Kevin. I know it's not Pastor Kevin. So what do you think I did with that message, Shoreline? I hit reply. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Of course, I hit delete emphatically. Delete, delete, delete. That was a hacker. That was a spammer, obviously trying to gain access to my phone. And it wasn't just me that they sent this to. Several other people on our staff got it as well. So I think about the enemy, though. Think about how the enemy operates. He operates the same way, doesn't he? He tries to mask himself as good. He tries to access it. So how do we discern? How do we discern when the enemy's attacking, when he's speaking lies? How do we discern the truth of God's voice? Well, what we have to do is we go to the truth of God's word. We know that God's word will never contradict what he says. His word is true from beginning to end. And so when the enemy comes and when somebody begins to speak these lies, we just have to go, is it true? Is it true? And we don't go, oh, okay, it's my truth. It's, it's, it's God's truth. We align it with God's truth. So then we recognize that if it's not in alignment with God's truth, if it's counter to the truth of God's word, then it's not of God. It's of some other source. So we have to align with Scripture. So we have to know God's word. And we also have to respond like Jesus did. We know God's truth, and when the enemy brings those lies, what do we do? We respond in truth. We respond in truth and with truth. And so the question then for each one of us this morning is think about this. Where is the enemy attempting to deceive you? Where is he attempting to mislead you, to confuse you, maybe to conceal the truth from you, to get you away from God's plan and God's will, to allow him to get a foothold in your life? Where is he attempting to deceive you? And I think about in our world today, the enemy likes to speak this lie, this truth. He, think, he calls it a truth, but it's really nothing but a lie. You know, you don't really need to be in the church to be part of the church. You don't really need to worship God and be in the church. Now, is it true that God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, and we can worship God anywhere by ourselves or gathered together? What's the truth, church? Absolutely. But, to believe that you don't have to be part of a church if you're a follower of Jesus, that's his lie. Because his desire is that you're not part of the body of Christ. Because as the body of Christ, you're actually walking with other believers, encouraged by other believers, using your gifts for the glory of God. He wants you to stay back here all by yourself where he can continue to speak his lies to you in isolation. I think another lie that the enemy's told, and we see this all throughout our, our culture today, is... I can have my truth. Anybody heard that one? I can have my truth. Like truth is relative. Truth changes. And we know that the truth is God's word is absolute truth. And some of you might say, I've never heard that. I don't think that is out there. I was watching uh, a couple, I guess it was a couple years ago now, I was watching after a basketball game and a certain Los Angeles Lakers star basketball player, his initials are LJ. I won't say his name though. He said this, when they asked him, this is what they asked him, they said, what would you tell other upcoming basketball players? What would you encourage them? And this is what he said, pursue your own truth. That's what he said, pursue your own truth. So church, the question is, what, how do we, what do we say? Is it true? Is that true? When we know the answer, if we pursued our own truth, we just walk right off a cliff because our own truth changes, doesn't it? But we pursue God's truth. We pursue God's truth. And so as we think about the enemy's tactics, we think about temptation and deception, it can be really discouraging 
and it can be really defeating. And if I just stopped right there, the sermon ended right there, you'd walk out of here going, what was that? So what I want to do is I want to finish strong. I want to finish with three spiritual truths. These are timeless truths. These are hard but essential truths. You have to hear it. You have to hear this. Number one is this. You can't win this fight. You can't win this fight. You can't win this fight without Jesus. Let me finish that sentence. You can't win this fight. The enemy's too crafty, too sneaky. He's perfected his trade craft. He will win every time. But with Jesus, oh, we can stand in the victory of Jesus. And where does the victory of Jesus start? Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 57. It says this, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? God gives us the victory. He gives us the victory so that we can overcome the enemy's schemes in the victory of Christ. Because when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he gives us, number one, we're forgiven of our sins. We inherit eternal life. We get every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, God's word says. And his Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. So now we have spiritual discernment to recognize God's voice and to recognize and resist the schemes of the enemy. And, oh, by the way, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he grants us grace and mercy and love. So when we fail and when we fall for the enemy's schemes, not if, when we do, his arms wrap you. He's ready to bring you home. He takes you into his arm. He loves you. He encourages you and sends you back out. The grace of Jesus. And where does the victory of Jesus start? Where do we start in walking in the victory of Jesus Christ? We start with surrender. We start with surrender. We come before the King of Kings. We lay down our life and we say, Jesus, I accept your grace. I receive your forgiveness. I want to follow you all the days of my life. And then we allow Jesus, we stand in victory of Jesus and we walk with Jesus all the days of our life, recognizing that we will be attacked by the enemy, but we don't have to succumb to his attack from a position of defeat. We stand in victory of Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. And so for some of you today, maybe you've yet to experience the victory of Jesus Christ. You've not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Maybe today would be the day when you step forward and you come and you place your life in Jesus' hands. We also know the other spiritual truth is this. You can't win this fight without spiritual weapons. You can't win this fight without spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 4 says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And those strongholds are the enemy's strongholds. And last week, Pastor Kevin talked, as he shared from Ephesians 6, about the defensive weapons, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. He also talked about the offensive weapons, God's word, God's word, the sword of the spirit, and prayer, the importance of prayer. But I want to share with you this morning, and it really struck home when we were singing songs of praise earlier, I believe that worship is also a weapon. And this morning, I think for many of you, you might have came in and you experienced that worship as a weapon because you might have came in a little bit discouraged, maybe even down, maybe a little bit defeated, knowing that you've been under attack from the enemy. And as you came in and you began to see the lyrics, you began to utter those words, and you began to sing praises to Jesus. As you were singing praises to Jesus, guess what's happening to the enemy's voice that's speaking lies? It's getting quieter and quieter and quieter as you lift those praises to Jesus. And so when the enemy attacks, one of the spiritual weapons that you can wield against is worship. It's singing praises to Jesus to quiet the voice of the enemy. Why? Because he can't stand to hear praises of Jesus. Amen? So worship as a weapon. And what we also know as a spiritual truth is you can't win this fight without trusted teammates. You can't. You can't win this fight on 
your own. You can't win this fight alone. And what we realize is that one of the enemy's greatest lies is the lie of self-sufficiency. Oh, I can do it. I can do it on my own. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And the picture here is of two warriors standing back to back on the battlefield. And with Christ at the center, that third cord, and it's standing back to back against the enemy coming against them. Because the importance of standing back to back is what? In a battle, if my eyes are here, where are my eyes not? I can't see what's behind me. And the enemy loves to come behind, loves to come from the flanks. So having that person in your life, those people in your life that you can stand back to back with, with Christ at the center to help you recognize and resist the schemes of the enemy. And so who are the trusted teammates in your life? If you're married, it's your spouse. You're not duking it out. You are standing back to back with Christ at the center. But we all also need to have people in our life that pray with us, encourage us, hold us accountable. So I want to encourage you to think about that. And so as we wrap up our time this morning is this. What's your next step? What is your next step to walk in the victory of Jesus and stand against the enemy? What's your next step? For some of you today, you've never placed your faith in Jesus. For you, it's a bold step forward to come up here. I'm going to be right down up front. I'm going I'm, I'm to put myself right here. And if you have questions about faith in Jesus Christ, I would love to have a conversation with you. I'd love to pray with you. So I'll be right here after the service. And if you're online, you can text, you can send a note there to your online chat host. They would love to talk with you more about what it means to follow Jesus as well. But for some of you today, you're feeling the, just overwhelmed by spiritual attack, either for you or somebody in your family. We've actually got a robust number of our prayer partners today. They have been planning, they have been praying, and they have been preparing for this day, waiting for you and praying for you. And so today, my encouragement is your bold step might be to come forward and ask for prayer. It's to humbly come forward and allow them to pray for you. And today, they are going to be actually anointing you with oil. And I've got my little anointing bottle here. This is a bottle of anointing oil. There's nothing magical about this. But the oil that's here, they're going to anoint you. It's a powerful symbol of God's presence and God's protection over you or family members, the people you ask for prayer. So I want to encourage you today to step forward. That might be your bold and courageous step. And then finally, for some of you, it's simply stepping and saying, I want to re-engage in God's word. I want to re-engage in more intentional prayer. I want to re-engage in worship at an all new level. It's that's your step for you today. And so as we close today, I want to just finish with that great verse from John 10.10. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But the second half of that verse says this, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus' desire is that you would experience life to the full through him. And we know the enemy's gonna come, but he is calling you into a life relationship with him. And today is that day for some of you and for all of us, it's walking with him for the rest of our lives. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you as well, Jesus, that you are all powerful. The enemy might be powerful, but Jesus, you are all powerful. And so Jesus, today, as my brothers and sisters, as we've gathered here, as we've heard your word, as your spirit speaks to each one of us, I pray, Lord, now that for each one of us, that we would take those bold steps that you've laid on our hearts now. We thank you, Jesus, for this. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so if you are on campus, again, our prayer teams will be down here up front. And as I was praying there, the Lord just put on my heart that for some of you, the enemy right now is speaking these words, these whispers, saying, you don't need prayer. Just go ahead and walk out. Nobody's going to know. Can I just say, don't listen to the lies. He doesn't want you to come be healed. He doesn't want you to come and have prayer. So I want to encourage you, don't walk out those doors. Don't click off online. Ask for prayer. 
ask for prayer and allow God to bring healing where needed, where God to bring strength where needed, God to give you peace where needed. And for those of you who are online, again, you can just go ahead and send your prayer request to the email listed there as well. But we also want to say welcome to those of you who are new today. Thank you for joining us. If you're here on campus, you can go out these doors. The Connection Center is there. They'd love to give you a gift and say thank you for coming. Also, for those of you online, you can just text the word welcome to the number on the screen there as well. And also today at 1230, in about 18 minutes, we have a baptism class. If you've never been baptized before and you would like to be part of our October 6th beach baptism, yes, we're going to baptize on the beach. If you'd like to be part of that, this is your last opportunity to have that class before the beach baptism. So again, 1230 Peninsula Room, Pastor Dennis will be leading that class. And so for those of you who are here on campus, whether you're here in the worship center, in the courtyard, or out in the family worship venue, and for those who are joining us online, if you're able, would you stand and receive the blessing as we send you out into this week? We know that the enemy is scheming, but we know our Lord Jesus is victorious. And so go in his grace, go in his strength, go in his power, and go in his grace as you leave from this place. Walk with him. Be ready for the enemy. Be confident in the victory that you have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.